Hello Pores, it's me, the Twitter user who just bought a beachside mansion at only 20 years old. <laughs> it just goes to show how if you work hard and save your money, you can become just as rich as me and my family who own a diamond mine in South Africa. <laughs> Hashtag pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Hashtag yes, my parents paid for the down payment and the mortgage and my groceries. Hashtag God bless America. I'm cosplaying a rich person today. And this is also, this is not an alcoholic, this is cranberry juice, but I, I do wanna simulate like wine. That's why it's in a wine glass and not like a fun cup. Props. <laughs> Hi pores again, but um, like poor affectionate, not derogatory, so it's a bit different this time. My name is Ashley, and this is my channel, Ash Y, where I just answer questions. Honestly, I just answer questions that I put in my notes folder that I'm just, I just want to know more about. And today's question is, why does America hate poor people? <laughs> I want to learn why the country, the people in government hate poor people. I want to learn about why rich people hate poor people. I want to learn about why middle class and poor people hate poor people. Everyone hates poor people. And I'm going to get to the bottom of it from being annoyed at how people spend their welfare checks to passively letting people die because of poverty violence. It's very apparent to me that there is a deep-seated resentment toward people without money. In my research, I found that hating poor people isn't just some strange symptom of American society. It is integral to its foundation. Our current political systems and our current economic systems would not exist if it were not for the rampant, pervasive hatred toward people without money. So sit back and try to relax as much as you can under late stage capitalism. <laughs> as I tell you about the history of hating poor people, the current state of poorness in America, and then finally how you have been manipulated into victim blaming poor people for their own position and likely blaming them for a whole host of other things. <laughs> pretty problematic origin story. America is a country built on genocide, slavery, and Protestant ideals. Protestantism basically holds that if you work hard, God will reward you with a good life. America began as a largely Protestant country, the religion permeating into its culture, government, and work. Calvinism is one of those like spring off theologies that was created by John Calvin, who was a wealthy lawyer in the 16th century. Calvinism maintains that the people who are gonna go into heaven are pre-selected before they're born. Protestants believe that material success is one of the best indicators for who God chose to go to heaven. Poverty then was a sign that God had already decided you would be going to hell. So the more material wealth you have, the closer you are to God, the more holy you are. This belief convinces its followers that those who have money are good and those who don't have money are bad. And this is like obviously ridiculous for a, a lot of reasons. There are many instances where no matter how hard you work, your material reality bars you from acquiring as much wealth as other people. In pre-Civil War America, the only people who were allowed to amass any sort of wealth from their labor were white men. That means the only people on God's eternal chill list at the time were white men. And if you weren't able to acquire as much wealth as white men, then that meant that you weren't as close to God. And if you didn't have any wealth at all, that meant you were gonna go to hell. And I don't want to associate with people who are going to hell. I mean, like, oh my gosh, I mean, I'm, I'm God's chosen one. He wouldn't want me associating with the pores. At the core of this country, as reflected in its laws and dark oppressive history, is the idea that the only true American is one that is white and wealthy. Further, the constitution and governing documents were created exclusively by wealthy landowning white men, a lot of them Protestant, who didn't believe that non-white people or women were 
human beings. <laughs> they thought they were closer to the devil. But uh, thankfully that's in the past and it has no impact on society nearly three centuries later, right? 20th century sociologist and economist Max Weber calls the Protestant work ethic at this time proto-capitalist considering at America's founding no one was individually or collectively capitalist. In his book The Protestant Ethic and Spirit of Capitalism, Weber argues that Western capitalism was founded as a result of the Protestant work ethic. This ethic encouraged people to work as much as they could and accumulate as much material wealth as they could because remember you want to be close to God. It subsequently discouraged people from spending woefully on luxuries or giving money to the poor as that was considered rewarding beggary. This conservative lifestyle combined with a work ethic that encouraged people to work a lot resulted in a lot of available money so much money that people didn't know what to do with it. Weber explains that this issue was solved by investing, trading, or starting personal enterprises. People using their money to make themselves richer rather than giving it to people who need it. That is just such a convenient religion to institutionalize for a capitalist. <laughs> like that is like the capitalist religion. The Protestant practices of the time all planted the seed for capitalism as we know it today. Even after the decline of religion, we obviously still see these norms of working hard and hoarding your personal wealth. This history created the framework for life under capitalism. A life where everything material, immaterial, luxury, necessity, is assigned some arbitrary value. Capitalism deepened its talons into our society by manufacturing generations of poor people to exploit. Medium writer Umayyar Haq writes, Capitalism grew so rich precisely by exploiting the average American, leaving them in a state that Marx would have called immiseration. Being paid just enough to subsist and having all the cream of your labor, which is to say your energy, creativity, ideas, passion, or just plain hard work skimmed off the top. You can think of a miseration as something like being offered the lowest price possible for your labor and having no choice but to take it, while also having to pay the highest price possible for the very things you create. What a beautiful trap. If you're a capitalist, that is. But what if you're not? Being poor basically means that you don't have the money to make decisions for yourself. It means that you have to compromise your expectations of a good life, being forced into substandard conditions because you can't afford anything better. In the area I'm from, the most affordable housing still takes up a majority of its tenants' income. The water is contaminated, there's a bedbug infestation, and the landlord serve five-day eviction notices to tenants who complain too much, which actually happened to a friend of mine. <laughs> All the barriers to a good life poor people experience only further exacerbate their poverty. For example, being evicted because you failed to pay rent means that you're much less likely to get approved for decent, affordable housing. You have to spend more of your income on bills, meaning that you are left most of the time with only a few dollars a day to provide for yourself and your family. That means no food, no clothes, no luxury items, no transportation a lot of the times no means to fix things at once they're broken, all things that push you further into poverty. Poverty is cyclical. It's very difficult to break out of, especially with these self-reinforcing mechanisms. A more technical definition comes from the Census Bureau, which deems a person impoverished when they have an income of less than $11,139 annually, or any family of four living on less than $22,314. The number of people that fall under this threshold continues to grow each year. And I know, I know what you're thinking. Ashley, um, actually, America's GDP has gone up over the years and individual income has also increased. Yeah, look at where that's happening. <laughs> when you look closer at that top quintile, you can see that the top of the top quintile has gotten exponentially more wealthy since the 80s. The mean income per adult in the top 0.01% is almost $29 million annually. <laughs> 
In the other quintiles, you see that people's income has been stagnated since the 70s. All the while, the cost of life has exploded. The cost of healthcare has gone up by 2,000%. Education, 1,000%. Rent, 500% food 400%. Income inequality has further deepened throughout history because minimum wage has not increased, union membership has declined, and America's social safety net is tattered with holes. No one is there to catch you when you inevitably fall through. With wages staying the same and a continuously increasing population of people going into poverty, how can people be expected to live a fulfilling life? And the answer is not everyone is meant to. <laughs> Capitalism as we know it would implode if everyone had access to living happily. If we lived in a society where people didn't have to work shitty jobs to maximize profit for that top 1%, who would work at a cash register at McDonald's? Who would cut the heads off of animals in slaughterhouses? Who would sit at a desk all day sending meaningless emails under fluorescent lighting? It is really good for wealthy people to have poor people rely on their jobs in order to get money in exchange for necessities. Necessities that rich people have stock in. Necessities whose inaccess makes them a lot of money. The multimillionaires invested in privatized healthcare could not care less about your broken ankle. <laughs> they don't care. They want you to go into debt because chaining you to a cash register and charging you $500 for saline solution funds their trips to Cabo. So then you have people who are relatively poor competing for seemingly limited resources and justifying their own situation through the relief that even though they're sitting at a desk all day, staring at a computer that fries their eyeballs, at least they're not cutting the limbs off of animals and at least they're getting paid more than the people who say, hello, may I take your order? But they all have much more in common with each other than they do with any prick that has a Rolex collection and five yachts. Those pricks are killing us, but we love them. We envy them. We want to be them because they have power. They get to say yes or no. They get to decide what they want, how they want it, where they want to live. They have mass media followings. People tune into their lives every week. They get to defy aging. They get to shop designer. They get to shop in the organic section at Whole Foods. They get to. And who cares who they hurt? How much of a human is that McDonald's worker really? If they want me to validate their humanity, why don't they try working harder? <laughs> Sagging bootstraps is an epidemic in this country. Since the beginning of the pandemic, 8 million more Americans have gone into poverty, making the total number of people in poverty around 40 million. Over half a million people are homeless, but that number is likely much more. Once the federal rent moratorium is over, it's anticipated that anywhere from 30 million to 40 million people are going to lose their homes, which only adds to America's homeless population and to those in poverty. And this statistic is pre-pandemic, so I'm sure it's gotten worse, but four in 10 Americans cannot afford a $400 emergency. What this all means is that there are millions of more people who are near the brink of poverty too. Can you even imagine how many people that is? How many people spend most of their life constantly worried that one bill means no heat, no water, no food, no house? So many people who can't afford a hospital bill hoping that fractured ankle will just heal itself or that that back pain or those constant nosebleeds are probably nothing. Millions of people denied basic dignity because they can't afford it. They don't have enough money to feed themselves or their children because the majority of their income goes toward paying the rent for an apartment that's infested with bed bugs, has lead in the water, and is owned by a landlord who couldn't care less if they lived or died. And the most popular and sensitive prescription to this is asking them to pull up their bootstraps or work hard or save their money. These phrases run under the assumption that poor people can get themselves out of a situation that is near impossible to get out of alone. You'd really think that people in poverty aren't trying to get out of poverty. No one wants to live like that. A common like speaking point is just saying like, oh, well, it's all about mindset. If those people just had the right mindset, then they you know, if they just invested, if they just like learned how the stock market works, like blah, blah, blah. Like if they just learned all of these, like all of these ways to like game the system, it's like, I mean, they, they're not even players. <laughs> like they can't game the system that they're not even players of. 
it's just so tone deaf to me it's just so tone deaf and insensitive and, and like these people have don't have an ounce of empathy in their body they just i mean we're gonna get to why that is <laughs> these insensitive sentiments are steeped in those protestant ideals of working hard and hoarding your wealth we're led to believe that sagging bootstraps is the problem when we don't even stop to wonder why they're down in the first place despite the horrifying conditions of poverty People who are poor often find themselves at the end of that God-bestowed all-American shotgun barrel. Poor people are blamed and shamed for everything. Blamed for a struggling economy, blamed for a dying planet, blamed for your suboptimal class status, blamed for their own poverty. People in power will literally find any way to deflect blame away from themselves and onto the people working three jobs only to break even after taxes and bills. To explain this phenomenon, Janice Robinson from the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy writes, Scapegoating poor people, particularly black and brown people, is an old hat political bludgeon used in pursuit of a public policy agenda that concentrates economic and political power among an elite few to the detriment of a vast majority of us. Policies that improve economic well-being and target economic inequality, like progressive taxation or allocating more funding towards social welfare programs, are met with wealthy opposition. People who stand to reap massive profits off of a continuation of the exploitative status quo. People who have power want to keep it, and everyone wants more than what they have. And capitalism offers an attractive fast pass to power. Capitalists tell you to get a job and save your money and then you can join us. The elite who don't have to lift a finger for another comma in their bank account. The people who have the autonomy to say yes or no. They say tip your noses up and spit down on the family with bad credit living in a motel and the man whose bed is the sidewalk, what, they should have worked harder. And then yes, after you do that, you can join us. Post that tweet saying Jeff Bezos shouldn't have to pay taxes and then imagine yourself living in that lavish mega mansion millions of people breaking their backs for your company and then yes yes after you do that you can join us the few and the proud the top of the top one percent the hoarders of the only thing that matters in this godforsaken rotting hellhole of a planet the poors did that by the way we are bigger than life we are bigger than you and actually no <laughs> no of course you can't join us if anyone could be rich, then that means the classless, scrounging filth would ruin all the best vacation spots. If not for the deep chasms of wealth inequality in this country, how would I distinguish myself as a cultured woman of means? And what fun is having all of these diamonds if having them is at no one's expense? The basic definition of hate is an intense hostility and aversion, usually deriving from fear, anger, or a sense of injury. At the root of hating poor people is the fact that we are scared to be them, because we know that once that happens, no one is looking out for us. Everyone hates you, you're anxious all the time because you can't afford to buy things that you need and you can't make decisions for yourself. Your identity is demoted to that of poor, a title which in itself evokes pity rather than action. The hard truth is, no matter how much you defend billionaires online, you will not be a billionaire yourself. All you're really doing is mistakenly defending a status quo which harms you as well as your non-billionaire followers that see you making an absolute fool of yourself on the internet. So many people are convinced that if they play the game correctly, then they will eventually win. The problem is that the game is rigged, dude. Not everyone is supposed to win. But people are still convinced that they can because they need to somehow justify the grueling hard work that the maintenance of capitalism requires of them. They need reassurance that working 70 hours a week is just admirable hustling <laughs> that they can just grind their way out of being poor. <laughs> Inevitably, when people don't get there, they don't know what to do with themselves. They're like, my entire life I was promised that if I work hard and if I save my money and if I invest in the right stocks, then I should be Jeff Bezos rich by now. And those people need some target for that angst that they're feeling, some explanation as to why they're stuck. 
So you listen to the politicians and the talking heads telling you why you have yet to reap the capitalist fruit of your labor, and they point to poor people. Never mind that those very people are the ones voting against minimum wage increases and against universal health care, giving billions of your tax dollars to Israel so they can bomb children, and refusing to regulate exploitative business practices that keep people poor. Umair Haq, in a different article, writes, because capitalism needs to sell you hate to thrive, it's as predictable as the sunrise that in a capitalist economy, racists, bigots, and supremacists, not to mention violent abusers, will rise to the top and rake it in. They are the ones who have the most saleable products of all. A scapegoat for your anger. A target for your resentment. A monster for your hate. The soothing picture of yourself as an aggrieved, wronged victim, which mollifies your guilt and shame and becomes constant fuel for the very fire of spite that being just another disappointed troll has left you with. Now you know who to hate and why, how to hurt them the most and where, who to resent most and how. Bang. <laughs> there, that's the rush, that hit, that kick. Dopamine, adrenaline, power, control, status. What a thrill races through you. Now you're hooked. Capitalism is selling you relief from its very own misery in the form of pleasure through hate. Only maybe you don't know it yet. Capitalism is a system which requires that many people remain impoverished so there will always be some group to reassure others about their own position in the social hierarchy. It gives them a taste of what real power feels like, a pseudo power akin to the one capitalism promises. It's an addiction that keeps people complicit and blind to the fact that it actually isn't great to have so many people who are suffering in dead-end jobs. <laughs> or it's not great that so many people would lose their homes after a trip to the hospital. People without money are easier targets for our political grief because they really don't have the power to defend themselves against accusatory claims. Oh, what? Are you going to listen to what a poor person has to say about politics? <laughs> Honey, there's not a single poor person in Congress. Would you believe a poor person's account of their own experience? God, imagine if everyone was mad at the people collectively hoarding billions of dollars in offshore accounts to evade taxes that could easily solve any one of the social problems we have without threatening anyone's millionaire status. Getting mad at the people who receive billions of dollars in government subsidies for their companies that already make billions of dollars in profit each year would get your invite to Mark Zuckerberg's pool party revoked for sure. Yeah, no, you're right. Let's stay mad at the single mom who has to stay in a low paying job because a moderately higher paying job would disqualify her for food stamps. Let's stay mad at the people who were screwed over because of the lack of tenant rights in this country and have to move out of their apartment in five days and try and find a landlord who will accept them with an eviction on their record. Because those poor people somehow have more of an influence over why your life is shitty than the ones that pay the people in office to institutionalize their interests that actually make your life shitty. Or at least it feels good to think so. Derogatory claims made toward poor people come from what Boston University anthropology professor Chiara Bridges calls the moral construction of poverty. The moral construction of poverty is the idea that people are poor because they are lazy, irresponsible, averse to work, sexually promiscuous, criminally inclined, or simply stupid. This explanation of poverty, which locates the causes of poverty in the indigent individual and completely ignores the social structures within which that individual exists, is the simple idea that people are poor because there is something morally wrong with them. That should sound familiar. This way of thinking influences the way society goes about helping people who need money. There's this taboo that if you receive government assistance, then you're some kind of parasite. Which is insane to me because that is our money. That's our money. We pay taxes so the government can help other people. When more than half of that money is going to the military and funneling weapons to other countries, when billions of that money is going toward private companies instead of the 14 million households who are food insecure or the 38 million households who are housing insecure, there is no reason 
Poor people should be shamed for claiming any government pocket change available to them. People who are poor are thought of as these leeches on society when it's literally rich people that outsource their work onto other people and hide their money overseas to boost their profits and avoid paying taxes for things that we need, like school, healthcare, and infrastructure. I just find it interesting that poor people are characterized as, you know, lazy, averse to work, irresponsible, criminals, <laughs> or stupid, when those are much more appropriate labels for rich people. How much more averse to work can you get when you contract people in other countries to work in sweatshops so that you can go boating every other week? And on top of that, rich people are resoundingly more criminally inclined and their crimes tend to hurt more people, they just have the money to get away with them. And honestly, the stupid part, it speaks for itself. Just because you have money doesn't mean you're smart. All I have to say on the matter is that projection is a hell of a drug sweaty. At the beginning of this video, I asked you to try and relax. When you live in a society that treats people without money the way that they do, when you don't have money, it's very difficult to find peace. Under my new constitution, the First Amendment is the right to relax. Everyone deserves just to chill, like the right to chill. That is a top priority in my, in my dictatorship. <laughs> the TLDR for this entire video is that rich people are leeches on society and they are killing us and making us believe that we are crazy for wanting our basic necessities met by the government. In political science, there are a lot of different philosophies as to like what the role of government in a society should be. So I know that my takes are not gospel and like not everyone thinks that like that's what the government should do, but like sorry that I'm such a freaking radical that I think that the government should make sure that everyone has access to basic necessities regardless of their income level. I mean, I hope that I have backed up my radical opinions with um like facts and evidence and like i hope i followed through on my arguments well and if i didn't let me know in the comments even if you want to be mean like that's fine i can take it <laughs> if you liked this video please like and comment and consider sharing it with your friends i hope that you are doing all right and that you can find some peace today Thank you.